So, so we'll move on to the uh, next speaker, which is uh, Dr. Vignesh Kannan. He's a postdoctoral fellow at the Mechanics of Materials Group at ETH Zurich. And he's going to talk to us on the kinematics of polarization and electromechanical coupling uh, in bulk ferroelectric ceramics. Uh, so over to you, Dr. Kannan. Uh, thank you, Professor Jog. Yeah, yeah. Um, can I, am I audible enough? Yes, right yes, now? yes. Great. Uh, and I'm assuming my screen is in full screen, my presentation is in full screen mode? Right yes, yeah. yes. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I'd first like to thank the organizers of the symposium for uh, inviting me for uh, this particular symposium. Um, and next, I'd like to congratulate Professor Simha. I personally have not had um, any interactions with him uh, on a personal scale, but um, from just listening to anecdotes from his students and his colleagues over the last two days, I can only imagine that um, he would have had a really rewarding career and I wish him all the best for the next phase. <clears throat> so the work I'm gonna to present today is a rather recent work from um, my postdoctoral research here at ETH. Um, <clears throat> so this is basically a phase where we set up a lab and we're right now at the, at the point of making uh, interesting measurements on ferroelectric switching. Um, and a lot of the physics of um, where our observations come from is still up uh, in the air for interpretation. Um, I'd like to introduce my co-authors. Laurent Gwyn is our local theoretical expert um, who studies, who used to study semiconductors and now does ferroelectrics. Roman Indergans is a grad student in our group who does the numerical work and Dennis Kochman is uh, our advisor. <clears throat> so um, a quick introduction into ferroelectric materials. Um, I'm sure most of us are um, aware of the idea of piezoelectric materials which essentially generate electrical charges upon the application of mechanical stresses and vice versa. Um, ferroelectric materials are really a subset of um, these particular um, piezoelectrics and they're characterized by two major phenomena. And the first one is memory. What I mean by memory is uh, the fact that you have permanent polarization inside a bulk ferroelectric sample uh, upon the removal of external electric fields. And on application of an electric field in the direction opposite to this polarization, you end up with a switching, which is a very nonlinear phenomenon. So we have this switching of the polarization, which directly affects the mechanical strains. And there is an added effect of viscoelasticity, which is, um, which is rather unique to the experimental setup that we've built. So today we'll be discussing more about the ferroelectric switching and maybe a little bit of insight on the viscoelasticity. So applications, um, <clears throat> the figure on the left, here at the bottom is um, a rather more uh, conventional application that most of us would be used to. And this is in transducer applications, for example, in ultrasound. Um, the figure in the middle is also something we would relate to, but this specific application is uh, in the field of active structures where um, this group at Caltech, this is the space structures lab at Caltech, were uh, coming up with a design for space mirrors. The idea is if you send a mirror out into space to collect astronomical data, and there's a little bit of an aberration, um, <clears throat> how would you fix it? I mean, one, one solution a long time ago was to send personnel out into space to fix it. But if you were able to control this remotely, um, a potential solution would be to embed the backing of this mirror with an electroactive material. <clears throat> the image on the right is, uh, the schematic on the right rather, is something that's uh, at a much lower length scale than, we are, that, than what we are looking at currently, but it has direct implications in data storage and uh, transfer. <clears throat> So um, going into some of the basics of where this phenomena comes from at the atomic scale, most ferroelectric crystals are what we call perovskites. And what I mean by that is this particular crystal structure. If I take a unit cell and I have positive ions on the corners, I have oxygen anions in the, on the base center, and then I have another positively charged ion uh, sitting at the body center of this unit cell. Now, typically these, um, these um, corner ions are usually um, lead or barium in our very common uh, perovskites, and the center ion would be something like titanium or zircon. <clears throat> now, as you see this cubic crystal, this is nonpolar, which means by definition it cannot be ferroelectric. But when you reduce the temperature of these crystals down to what we call the Curie temperature, you start seeing a separation of the center of the positive and negative charges uh, in the crystal. Now, what we see is the transition from a cubic phase on the left to a tetragonal phase. In addition, what we gain is what's called this non-central symmetry. The non-central symmetry is basically a crystallographic term for the separation of charges. And this is uh, fundamental to defining a material as being. 
So if we zoom out one scale more, and I'm going to define something called a mesoscopic length scale. And I know the definitions of mesoscopic length scales can, can vary according to the uh, particular area that people are working in. Um, but here we're defining it as being somewhere in the nanometer to micrometer length scale. And why this is important is because this concept of polarization switching, till now we've been talking about it in a volume average sense, in a bulk sample. Um, <clears throat> if I look at this at the mesoscale, which I defined right now, um, imagine I'm applying an electric field opposite to the direction of polarization of a single crystal. You will have the nucleation of additional um, domains, as we call it, which have the polarization in a direction along the applied electric field. Now, as I continue to apply electric field in this direction, these interfaces between what we call domains, and we call these interfaces domain walls, they will begin to move across the sample. And this velocity of motion governs how fast we switch our samples. Now, like I showed here, this was just for a schematic description. Um, and this is a nice, beautiful one dimensional picture. But in reality, these domains are very, very intricate and complex patterns that form. So the image on the left is from a single crystal of barium titanate um, using a specific technique and a very interesting technique in physics called second harmonic generation microscopy. And you can see that there are different natures of domain walls. For example, if I look at this domain wall where my cursor is right now, and if somebody cannot see my cursor, uh, please do let me know. Um, <clears throat> this would be what you call a 90 degree domain wall where the polarization state across the wall has a reorientation of 90 degrees. In a similar definition, this would be a 180 degree domain wall. Now, this is an image from um, some of our work with uh, some of our barium titanate ceramic samples, which is polycrystalline by definition. You see these intricate patterns inside the grains. These really are the domains that we were talking about. So we can already imagine that studying the evolution of these complex, intricate, what we call laminate patterns, um, has important applications in designing materials at the technological length scale, as well as is a immensely complex problem to study right from an experimental, theoretical, and a numerical um, perspective. So um, this is basically the scale we will look at. We'll be looking at the meso length scales with measurements at the macroscopic length scale. So before we go into uh, the experiment itself, uh, I'm going to define a little bit of nomenclature so that all of us are more or less on the same page. Um, so imagine we start the, the material or the, the ceramic sample starts at this point. So the y-axis is polarization and the x-axis is electric field. Now at this stage, the sample has a net zero polarization. Like I mentioned, the crystal is always polar if it is ferroelectric, but then you have a distribution of domains that result in a net zero polarization. Now, as I increase the applied field, and this step is called polling in uh, ferroelectric literature, um, you, which basically means applying a large electric field of the order of two to three kilovolts to the sample um, over a time span of hundreds of seconds to minutes, such that you reach a maximum possible polarization. In an idealized system, this would mean everything becomes a single crystal, but that seldom happens in um, real materials. Now, from this point, when I start cycling or start reducing the electric field, now I start switching, which basically means polarization begins to evolve. Now, at this point, you have what's called the saturation polarization, which is basically the, uh, the polarization state of the material at zero electric field. And at this point where we hit what's called the coercive field, and this, this point at which the polarization switches directions is called the coercive field in the x-axis. Um, you see this almost instantaneous switching in polarization. And this is the critical part of uh, our study here. So linking the macroscopic and the mesoscale process, this is um, a cartoonistic description of what will happen. We start at this point where there's a distribution of these domains. Again, this is a one dimensional picture. You pole it such that you get an idealized single crystal. And as you cycle through the hysteresis curve, you have this motion of defects that propagate back and forth the sample. <clears throat> So in today's talk, um, most of our focus will be on understanding um, how these, or understanding the experiment that we've devised to understand ferroelectric switching, and essentially going into why this idea of kinetics at the mesoscale matters to us. <clears throat> so this is the objective of the experiment. It's an in-situ experiment that allows us to measure macroscopic electrical hysteresis and the electromechanical coupling in-situ. Uh, the sample geometry that we use is a little uh, more unconventional than what's used in traditional ferroelectric uh, literature, simply because of the fact that we are also interested in the viscoelastic, coupled viscoelastic properties of these materials. Um, so we have a cantilever beam, which is about one millimeter thick, uh, 
three millimeters wide and about 30 to 40 millimeters long. Um, we clamp it at the bottom and deposit electrodes on the surface. So now we have a capacitor in principle. Uh, we have a magnet which is mounted on top of the sample that allows us to apply mechanical vibrations using a pair of Helmholtz coils. And the electric fields uh, applied are of the order of one to three kilovolts in these systems. <clears throat> So like I said, the viscoelastic measurements could be done in situ during the evolution of polarization. But for this to be valid measurement, we have to make sure that the time scales of the viscoelastic or the mechanical vibrations are much shorter than the time scales of the electrical load, which basically means that we are probing the viscoelastic properties as a function of the quasi-static polarization. Mm, so I quickly jump into how we make these measurements. So like I said, we treat the sample as a ferroelectric capacitor. And as polarization switching happens within this capacitor, you have this accumulation of charges on the electrodes. Um, the conventional means of measuring these uh, charges and hence the dielectric displacement in these samples is by using what's called a Sawyer tower circuit. The idea is fairly simple where you put a reference capacitor in series that measures the charges from the ferroelectric capacitor. And then we measure the voltage across this to get the charges out. Now, significant problems exist with using this uh, along with uh, an oscilloscope, for example, with terms of long time stability. So what we have instead is a charge amplifier. And um, if we ignore all of the, uh, the electronic components and simply focus on the sample here and this operational amplifier, all that's happening here is the charge that's deposited on the sample is being read by this operational amplifier. And the operational amplifier is important in allowing us to increase the time at which we can hold charge during our measurements. Um, the charge from our samples is measured using what's called this feedback capacitor. And that feedback capacitor we can change uh, to measure, to adjust the resolution in our charge measurement system. So um, now going to the mechanical component of this experiment, um, <clears throat> we basically derive the idea of, of the broadband viscoelastic spectroscopy experiment. This is a classical experiment that was developed in the lab of Professor Roderick Lakes back in Wisconsin. And this was early in, I think, the late, the late 80s or early 90s. Um, <clears throat> and the idea is, is this. So you have a frame and you mount a viscoelastic sample uh, from this frame. There are a pair of magnets like I showed in our system. And you can apply torsional loads to these samples using these pair of Helmholtz coils. Now, using a deflectometer apparatus, which is this laser and detector, you can go ahead and measure the uh, deflection of the sample as well, and hence extract viscoelastic properties. Now in our system, we basically use a similar setup. We have a cantilever beam, and using the Helmholtz coils, we can apply a sinusoidal moment. We measure the sample rotation, which in the case of linear viscoelasticity would be phase shifted by a particular value. This value is the damping in the material, and the ratio of the amplitudes would give us the stiffness properties. At this point, we are restricted subresonant uh, measurements, um, but then we are looking at analytical ways of extending them to resonance or beyond resonance. <clears throat> so in um, summary, this is the a schematic of the integrated experiment. We have a cantilever beam with a mirror and a magnet mounted on top. The Helmholtz coils allow us to apply um, these moments uh, by basically mechanical vibrations to the sample. So we can do bending and torsion independently as well. Um, we use a 2D position sensing detector that allows us to measure the fine mechanical vibrations in the sample. But remember, there is also this larger um, strain because of the polarization evolution itself that we measure using um, three-dimensional DIC, you know, digital image correlation. <clears throat> now, the small amplitude mechanical fluctuations are basically extracted. The, the phase of these uh, mechanical vibrations are extracted in relation to an, a reference signal, which is the applied voltage to the coils. And with this, we can extract the amplitude and the phase difference of the um, um, mechanical deflections and hence directly calculate viscoelastic properties. And now the addition to the BVS or the viscoelastic experiment I was explaining before is the ability to apply electrodes and apply large amplitude electric fields uh, to these samples. And using our charge amplifier system, we can now probe the, the, the ferroelectric polarization and the mechanical response in situ simultaneously or independently. So <clears throat> I'll get into some first results that we have uh, on this is on lead zirconate titanate ceramics. Now these are technologically very relevant ceramics but then uh, they are from a mechanistic standpoint understanding them is a is a bit of a pain. 
I'd say. Um, <clears throat> so we apply an electric field of the order of um, 1.5 to 2 megavolt per meter. In absolute scale, because we have one millimeter samples, we're applying about 1,500 to 2,000 volts inside the lab. <clears throat> and we apply multiple cycles to uh, the sample. What you're seeing as a red curve right now is the measured dielectric displacement. And this is a little different from polarization itself um, because you have this, this concept of dielectric susceptibility as well feeding into polarization. <clears throat> So we can measure with good signal to noise ratio, very, very small charges uh, on the surface of the sample. And in this case, it was of the order of microcoulombs. <clears throat> and if you plot these together, we get the hysteresis curve. Now this is a hysteresis curve of uh, lead zirconate titanate. And what you see here is the, the phenomenon that we've been seeing in the schematics that we saw before. Uh, the idea being you have this small slope, which is related to just dielectric displacement and not polarization switching. And there's nearly instantaneous switching, which is associated with the nucleation and growth of domain walls. Now, one thing to note here is this very slight uh, asymmetry in the hysteresis curve across the x-axis. And this is a lot more evident when we run experiments on barium titanate. So the red curve is barium titanate and the blue curve is PCT. And we can right away see because of the hysteresis and the really fast switching times, why PCT is more preferred for um, technological applications. People are trying to move towards barium titanate, which is why this field is um, open for mechanicians to enter right now, because material design using some of these ideas are, um, are on the search for right now. <clears throat> so the, the next um, phenomenon I'd like to look at is the uh, concept of rate dependence. And this is where we get into actually, we actually get into this mesoscale dynamics that uh, I was also referring to before. Now, these are a, a sequence of about 15 experiments or 15 cycles on uh, a PCT sample at three different loading rates. I've shown representative curves from each of our experimental data sets. The blue curve is at 0 0.1 hertz. The red curve is at a higher, uh, an order of magnitude faster loading rate. And the green curve is yet another order of magnitude um, faster loading rates. So in, in um, addition to others, I'd like to draw your attention to three um, important or three critical phenomena that we see here. The first thing is what we defined as this instantaneous switching right here is no longer instantaneous. Essentially what we're saying is that there is an increase in the slope as you move to higher rates. Now going to the mesoscale dynamics, this basically means that the domains are finding it harder to nucleate and grow as we increase the loading rate. And this is why understanding the limiting rates at which mesoscale domains can grow becomes important. The second idea, which is directly related to the explanation I was giving you right now, is the increase in the coercive field. And physically, this means that I have to apply larger, slightly larger coercive fields that allow me to um, <clears throat> switch these samples um, accordingly. Now, this is um, a plot of the spontaneous polarization or saturation polarization on the, on the x-axis, I'm oh, sorry, on the y-axis on the left versus the cycling frequency. And you can see that the, the saturation polarization begins to go down. And all this means is, as I am increase the rate of loading, I am not giving my domains enough time to nucleate and grow. This is feeding directly back into this mesoscale dynamics argument, where I'm saying I'm not giving the domains enough time to nucleate and grow. So the domains basically stop at some point, which results in a net lower saturation polarization. And we've already discussed this monotonic increase in the course of field. So, Understanding the mesoscale kinetics becomes important in light of this recent experimental data that we have. Um, <clears throat> now, um, I will, we, we will do a little detour into the viscoelastic properties as well, because this becomes important in the context of uh, domain distributions. <clears throat> so these were prior experiments on a previous version of this experiment, uh, prior uh, um, data sets from previous version of this experiment. And what you see as a frequency on top is at different electrical cycling frequencies. Uh, similar to the experiments we were, do, we were showing you before. But the measurements here are the relative Young's moduli, which is basically the viscoelastic stiffness, and the image on the right is the damping. And so one observation is the fact that the viscoelastic properties are, a much, uh, are much more sensitive to the electrical loading rate, rates than, are the, than the polarization itself. <clears throat> and the, the rationale behind this particular observation is, is, is such. So imagine we have um, a particular volume of the material and there is a distribution of domains. 
I could have multiple um, non-unique distribution. I could have multiple distribution of domains that result in a single polarization, which essentially means to say that I do not have to have a unique microstructure for a unique polarization value, macroscopic polarization value. It turns out that this distribution of domains might be more relevant to the control of viscoelastic properties than the macroscopic polarization itself. And this is something that has potential applications in design for viscoelastic control. Um, <clears throat> so I'll slowly start pulling out of the presentation by, um, by giving you some insight into the type of modeling that uh, my colleagues in the group are doing. Um, so imagine for a purely tetragonal system, which is the case of barium titanate, we have um, you have a tetragonal crystal that has a particular polarization. Uh, hello, Dr. Kandan. Sorry for interrupting. Uh, yes. So, yeah, you, we'll take questions in another five minutes. Yeah. Sure. Great. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. yeah. You can continue. Yeah. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so, um, going back to this idea, imagine we have a purely tetragonal system, which means that I have a given orientation of polarization in 1D. You can imagine that in 3D, you will have six equivalent um, positions of, um, of, um, of the polarization. Now, if I plot that in 2D, where basically I'm talking about a 2D plane, you can imagine an energy landscape, if you may, that basically has stable positions at four equivalent um, polarization positions, which is, which is described by this uh, schematic of the polarization directions here. Now, the constitutive law in, I mean, for people who've done a little bit of, little bit more of theoretical mechanics uh, in plasticity and things like that, Maybe you've come across this coleman noel procedure, but the idea is basically that um, you have the dielectric displacement D, which is defined as the derivative of this energy with respect to the electric field. Now, in, in, um, in mechanical systems, this would basically be where we say that the strain would be a derivative of the energy with respect to stress, essentially the driving force. Now, how fast this polarization evolves is uh, another problem that is where I think our niche stands. The idea is if you take a one dimensional system where you have a double well potential, imagine I apply an electric field in a particular direction, this double well potential will tilt towards the preferred direction of polarization because of the applied field. And the rate at which this polarization switches would be defined by what's called the allen kahn gradient flow. And all this says is that the rate of change of polarization would be defined by the gradient. In this case, it's a variational derivative, but it will be simply defined as the gradient of this potential landscape that I was describing. Now, this is the basis for most models that happen uh, in, in, in the field today. And the problem though, is that this is, is assumes linear kinetics for any type of domain wall nucleation and growth. Um, <clears throat> so, but then the reality is not that simple. And we see that there are complex domain patterns. The image on the left is um, from data that we have on a specific te uh, microscopy technique that allows us to measure polarization. And you can see the intricate patterns that tell you that there is a spatially uh, variant uh, polarization in the sample. Now, this would mean that every single type of domain wall inside this material would have different kinetics, essentially a different velocity as a function of the driving force in simple terms. And so this is the type of model that um, uh, we're currently developing within the group, which requires in-situ experimental techniques that we could well get ideas from in physics and material science. And this is a direction that we are going towards. <clears throat> and I can talk a lot more about this if anyone's interested. Um, I'd like to finish my talk by pulling out of the electromechanical system and moving into purely mechanical systems where interfacial kinetics and rate effects actually play an important role. So this is an example of beautiful experiments that I saw recently, a colleague introduced me to, these, to this paper, where they were pulling shape memory alloys at different loading rates. And you can see that the austenite martensite phase boundary and these images, basically the bright areas in these images show the nucleation and growth of these boundaries. You can see an increased density of these boundaries as you increase the loading rate. Um, in another last example from my own doctoral work when I was working at uh, Johns Hopkins University with Professor Katie Ramesh, we were looking at the strength of magnesium with respect to a specific def deformation mechanism called thinning. And the idea of winning is basically an interface where you have different crystal orientations on either side. So a very slow experiment like this inside an SEM would show the migration of these twin boundaries slowly. But when we did impact experiments uh, using high-speed microscopy, and this is 200 nanosecond resolutions of imaging, um, we were able to see the growth of these different, of these different twins. Um, yeah, it should be playing. Yeah, 
right? So we were able to see the growth of these twins. If you look at the image, the animation on the right right now, you could see the growth of these twins, followed by nucleation of additional twins instead of lateral growth of a twin boundary. Now, this would be associated with increased strength and predicting and going ahead and looking at mesoscale kinetics in a modeling framework would help control the ability to control rate effects in medieval systems. So with that, I'd like to complete my talk and with quick conclusions, we have an experiment that we call the BES that uh, we use to, to study ferroelectric ceramics and crystals. Um, our first measurements on PZT ceramics show a little asymmetry, which is a lot stronger in barium titanate. And we believe this to be because of texture in the material. The polarization switching in both these materials are highly dependent on loading rate. Um, and um, <clears throat> we see an increase in coercive field and a slight decrease in the saturation polarization uh, as we increase the loading rate. Um, <clears throat> with respect to viscoelastic properties, we have prior experimental data and we're currently running experiments on the, on the current setup that we have that shows a strong dependence of the viscoelastic stiffness and damping on the electric field rates. Uh, and this is even more sensitive than polarization. Finally, uh, we're working on uh, hybrid experimental and uh, theoretical methods that allow us to describe the mesoscale kinetics of the main walls and hence predict these macroscopic rate effects in more detail. Uh, with that, like, I'd like to thank you all for your interest and uh, take questions if there are any. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Kannan, for a very uh, interesting talk. So uh, there are some questions here. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, so so I'll just read out uh, one of the questions. So uh, hello, Dr. Vignesh, what was the electric field measurement method? Were you measuring it directly or were you actually measuring the voltage developed and then dividing it by distance between the electrodes? Plus, how long were you waiting before taking the measurement immediately as soon as you place the sample in the experimental setup or waiting for some time and how did you ensure that no nucleation was taking place it's a very long uh, question is, yeah yeah yeah, sorry. yeah sorry. Uh, this is actually an excellent question though um, yeah, so the yeah. first question um, uh, the latter is the is the is the right answer we basically uh, measure the voltage and then divided by the uh, by the thickness of the sample um, for the second question, um, I believe this is about the uh, times before we start the experiment, right? Yeah. Um, so the idea there is we first start with what's a polling step. So we perform, we apply large amounts of electric fields of the order of 1500 to 2000 volts again for about 100 to 150 seconds before every experiment. And then we turn off the field and then we wait for about um, a few tens of seconds before starting the dynamic cycling. So the idea is to ensure consistent initial conditions before every experiment. I hope I answered your question. There are a few more questions. Uh, Mr. Weiber, you mm -hmm. could speak up. Yeah, uh, am, I, am I audible? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, Dr. Kanan, thanks for a nice talk. Actually, uh, my, I mean, I have one fundamental question: uh, yeah, How does uh, the interdomain <laughs> spacing and uh, domain size affects the kinetics of polarization? Actually, uh, this is a very good question, and I, I'm afraid it's it's a rather involved question, which I really don't have an answer to. Uh, I can give you some insight on what we think might be happening. Um, we wouldn't expect the interdomain spacing to matter too much. I would expect the interdomain spacing to be affected by the stress fields around the domains, which is not that significant. The applied fields take care of that. So in principle, if we have an equilibrium system where we allow the material to saturate for a long enough time, we should be able to collapse all the domains into a single grain or a single crystal. The, the, the effect of multi-domains lies in the kinetics, and that's exactly something we're trying to understand. We don't really have a very good intuition on how these kinetics actually evolve at the mesoscale. And measurements of that would tell us how the interdomain spacings would remain. Okay, uh, one, one, one last question. In continuation with that, uh, how does the domain wall affect the kinetics actually, that 90 degree and 180 degree domain walls? Uh, this, is, this is a good question. So the, if, you, if you remember that driving force I was talking about, I didn't spend too much time discussing it, but um, it, based on the ideas, classical ideas by Averitni and Knowles, these are basically jumps in the, um, the, uh, the electric uh, enthalpy along with okay. uh, a dot product or, a, or a, um, uh, the, the basically the sigma double dot epsilon uh, tensors in, in mechanical systems. In electrical systems, this is added with the electric field dot product on the polarization. And this is taken normal to the direction of the 
um, of the domain wall. Now, this idea basically allows us to say that even if we consider the potential wells to be at the exact same positions, um, we still have an orientation dependence on how these domain walls move because simply because of the fact that you have different orientations purely by satisfying Gauss's law. Now, the other question is about how these potential wells that I was talking about actually evolve. This well is and it becomes a lot more of a complicated problem. So it's a it's a the easiest question is based on orientation and the harder answer is how the uh, potential uh, landscape changes thanks 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 yeah, i'm done thanks uh, so i think uh, yeah there are some more questions but i think we have run out of time so uh, i'm sorry about that so the other participants they can ask uh, you know by by writing to uh, dr kannan or or in the question and answers window uh, so I think, uh, so we'll just thank uh, Dr. Kannan for a very nice and interesting talk and, and we'll, so thank you, Dr. Kannan. Thank you. Uh, so, yeah, thank, thank you. Everyone. Yeah.